Around 33 million years ago, in the late Oligocene Epoch, a new virus emerged and infected some kind of mammal. As we're all well aware at this point, viral infections happen and spread all the time. But this time, this time was different. It would turn out to be the beginning of a viral outbreak that left its mark on the genomes of almost every order of mammals around today. The start of a huge ancient pandemic, one that touched many different species, spanned the globe, and lasted for more than 15 million years. Yes, now imagine that, a pandemic that lasted 15 million years. And we know this pandemic happened because in 2001, biologists discovered part of this ancient virus trapped in our DNA, a molecular fossil entombed in our own genome. This fossil wasn't the actual virus itself, but a fragment of its genetic material. Scientists named this DNA sequence ERVFC, and it's just one of a growing number of viral fossils that have been discovered in the genomes of modern animals. And I know you have questions about this because I definitely do. Like, what was this virus? How did it end up in our genome? What disease did it cause, if any? And is it doing anything in there right now? While we don't have all the answers yet, the legacy of this ancient pandemic is just one of the many stories hidden in our very own DNA, just waiting to be discovered. Whether they're animals, plants, or fungi, all living organisms have at least one thing in common. Their DNA is riddled with the remains of ancient viruses, and humans are no exception. These viral leftovers are known as endogenous retroviruses, or ERVs, and most of them are the remnants of ancient retroviruses that infected the egg or sperm cells of our mammal ancestors. Those kinds of viruses insert themselves into their host's DNA as part of their normal life cycle. And when this happens in reproductive cells, that viral sequence can be passed down from parent to offspring. Now, this doesn't happen with every viral infection. In fact, viruses embedding in the genome of their host is pretty rare, because everything has to go just right for this to happen. First, the virus has to integrate into the DNA of the sperm or egg cells at just the right spots to not kill those cells or disrupt how they work. Then, those cells have to be the lucky few that actually end up forming a fertilized egg, which is what allows the ERV to be passed down to the next generation. And then it has to keep getting passed on, even as these organisms change and evolve over time. But over millions of years, these rare events have happened often enough to leave a viral fossil record behind. In some ways, it's actually a lot like the other kinds of fossilization that we talk about around here. It requires specific conditions and only happens some of the time. Nonetheless, ERVs are so common in our DNA that, by most estimates, they make up around 8% of our total genome. And that's about four times higher than the proportion of our genome that's made up of genes, the sequences that actually code for proteins. So yes, you heard that right, but just in case you didn't, I'm gonna say it again. In terms of DNA content, you're about 8% virus and one to 2% genes. So what I'm saying is, you are more virus than you are genes. Now, figuring out where each bit of that viral DNA came from isn't easy. Many of these sequences have built up so many mutations and have been shuffled around so much that they're really fragmented and hard to make sense of. But in the case of ERVFC, that sequence tells the story of an ancient global multi-species pandemic, or maybe more accurately, a series of epidemics played out over a huge span of time. And while ERVFC was first identified in 2001, it wasn't until 2016 that a group of biologists at Boston College was able to piece together the history of that particular ancient virus. They searched the genomes of 50 modern species of mammals to identify fossilized sequences of ERVFC and found them embedded in the DNA of over half of those species. Those sequences were even shared between species as distantly related as humans and aardvarks. Now, when a biologist sees this kind of pattern, the first thing they try to figure out is whether there's some simple evolutionary explanation for it. Like, did the virus infect some early mammal that was the common ancestor of many different groups, so that this molecular fossil was just passed down to all of its descendants? In this case, the answer turned out to be no. It's a little more complicated than that. Instead of one infection event, it looks like this virus independently infected different mammal species and embedded itself in their genomes multiple times. For example, 12 of the mammals studied, including humans, pandas, and dogs, all have more than one genetically distinct sequence of ERVFC in their genomes. This suggests that there were many independent infection events by different strains of the virus as it evolved while spreading around the world. So we actually have two different fossils of ERVFC in our DNA. And as far as we know, they don't do anything right now. The older one comes from an infection in the common ancestor of all great apes, sometime between about 20 million and 16 million years ago. 
and the younger one we got from the common ancestor of all African great apes, between about 16 million and 9 million years ago. As for how widespread this pandemic was, it's likely that the virus made it to every continent except Antarctica and Australia, which were geographically isolated at the time. And this may explain why no Australian marsupials in the study, like wallabies and Tasmanian devils, were found to have any of that virus in their genomes. So those are some of the things that we can figure out about this ancient pandemic. But there are other things that we just can't because the fossil record of this virus is incomplete. After all, there are probably species that lost their sequences of ERVFC over time. And others were probably infected, but the virus didn't embed itself in their DNA successfully. And some lineages that might have carried the viral fossil have just gone extinct. So we're missing pieces of the puzzle, which makes some of the details of the virus's spread a mystery. But by using that method known as the molecular clock, and by building a family tree of the virus strains across mammal species, researchers think that the virus originated around 33 million years ago. And from there, it spread around the world for at least 15 million years. While we don't know what species the virus infected first, we can tell that it started jumping from group to group pretty quickly. There's evidence of at least 26 independent transmissions between species. And some of these events look pretty weird because the jumps weren't always between closely related species. For example, the sequence of this virus found in dolphin DNA is closest to those found in rodents and rabbits. Now, this doesn't mean that a dolphin caught the virus directly from a rabbit or vice versa, although I personally would love to know what that might have looked like. Like I said, the fossil record of this virus is incomplete, so we're probably missing some steps there. All we have to go on is what we know about how viruses jump between species today, like by one species preying or scavenging on another. Beyond that, we just don't know. But one of the reasons that the virus was so successful at hopping between species may have been its ability to swap genes with other strains and with other totally different viruses over the course of the outbreak. This is known as viral recombination, and it can happen when two different viruses infect the same animal at the same time. This lets them splice elements of their genomes together as they replicate within the same cell, and it happens naturally all the time. In fact, it looks like this is probably what happened to allow SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, to spread so successfully. There's good evidence that most of this virus is similar to coronaviruses seen in bats, but a bit of the protein that helps it enter its target cells looks more similar to another virus found in a pangolin. We still don't know what host animal was infected by both viruses, though. Now, recombination can also happen when a virus picks up genes from viruses that had already embedded some of their sequences in the host's genome. And there's evidence of multiple recombinations over the history of ERVFC. So it might have gotten the genes that helped it jump between species from other viruses and other strains. And this seems even more likely because one of those recombinations is in the protein that helped the ancient virus enter its target cells, which sounds pretty familiar. But what kind of virus was ERVFC? And how deadly was it? Well, we do know that the virus infected mammals, replicated in their cells, and occasionally became embedded in their genomes. And we could look at its closest living viral relatives to try to figure out what kind of infection it might have caused. Based on its genetic structure, ERVFC is an ancient member of a genus called gamma retroviruses. Today, this group includes the murine leukemia virus in mice and feline leukemia virus in cats. And one of the most common effects of this group of viruses is oncogenesis, or the formation of cancer in their hosts. So it's possible that the ERVFC virus caused similar illnesses, including cancers. But because we don't know what kinds of cells it infected, we can't tell whether it was likely to have caused leukemias or some other kind of cancer. And we might never know. As the genomes of more species are sequenced, our ability to untangle the histories of these viral fossils will only improve. Because ERVFC isn't the only viral fossil in our DNA. There are many others in the human genome whose stories are just waiting to be told. And without the record in our genome, we'd never have known this epic ancient pandemic ever happened. And these ancient remnants don't just help us understand what happened in the deep past. They show us that viruses have jumped between species for millions of years and still do. And they also help us understand and predict how new viruses behave and spread today, which I think we all can agree is pretty important. From one mammal millions of years ago to our DNA today, the story of ERVFC reminds us that pandemics are part of the history of life on our planet. And whether we like it or not, they'll be a part of our future too. Now, while ERVFC is a viral fossil, there are other ancient viruses that are still actively infecting us. Find out more in our episode, The Two Viruses That We've Had For Millions Of Years. Also, I just sanitized my hands, so high fives to this month's eontologists. Sean Dennis, Jake Hart, Annie and Eric Higgins, John Davison Ng, and Patrick Seifert. Become an Eonite by supporting us at patreon.com slash eons. Eonites get fun perks like submitting a joke for me to read, like this one, which I have not seen before, so. Okay, this is from Bethy Kennedy. 
What is a dinosaur's least favorite reindeer? <laughs> Comet. It's, it feels like too soon to me. Is that too soon? And as always, thank you for joining me in the Constantine Haza studio. Subscribe at youtube.com eons for more adventures in deep time.